Don't jump. Get off hey, that I'm bridge. Not scared. Don't nobody scared. Ain't nobody scared. Get off the bridge. We don't want you to jump. Barbara. Hey. Okay, I'm sorry. But no, no, no. I am uh I am one of the uh, one of the founders of the Soldier Twenty Three Project, which is a program <laughs> under our <laughs> number, which is uh, Together Community Service Initiative, and we started this about five years ago. Uh, I did about twenty six years in the army, and I didn't realize how bad uh, the suicide rate was. So at the time that we started. Uh, the suicide rate was, we was losing about 23 military personnel a day uh, to suicide. Uh, so, uh, you know, I had been doing the uh, Army entertainment and traveling around the world, so I got to see uh, soldiers uh, come to that show, and they were able to use their traumas uh, to, to channel their talents. So I got to see them... Uh, be able to just use their talents and gifts to, to channel their traumas. And I thought that was a, a pretty cool way to deal with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, depression, and anxiety. So I wanted to carry on that type of tradition. And, and, and me being a combat vet, uh, veteran as well, dealing with post-traumatic stress, I'm an artist and writer as well. So uh, the creative arts are just a way uh, to release those uh, I like what the gentleman was saying earlier about if you got if you got trash in your bag and you keep it in there, one day it's going to stink. So I just uh, I, I took a route to that and uh, and started the Soldier 23 Project as an effort to reduce the numbers of veterans that we're losing in that community a year. Well, so so we do things like uh, partner the uh, veterans up with. Uh, other organizations like film companies and other artists uh, to, to help bring out their talents and gifts. So uh, we also we also do outreach, like we have a food pantry. Uh, we also teach classes on infection control, first aid, CPR. Uh, so it's just a plethora of things that we offer to the community as well as uh, to the military community. So. So I've been spending all day today uh, giving out uh, giving out food and uh, bread and and also giving out uh, masks. So I was giving out free masks to the community. So we do things to just empower, in, inform, empower, and motivate uh, veterans to go and deal with their issues and problems. So we encourage them to get with their psychologists, psychiatrists, and the healthcare community to address their their uh, to address their problems. So that's pretty much what we do. Can I ask you something? Yes, ma'am. Okay, you said that you allow them to use their talents to deal with um, their, their stress and um, everything that they're going through. Okay, it's one thing to be able to put on a show. And I don't mean, you know, show as in, you know, I can be one way in front of a bunch of people, but in the solitude of my own home, that's when I would revert to being, you know, stressed out or whatever. So how how do you teach people to make that transition? Because as comedians and Mo and um, uh, Big Mo and Sylvia can uh, attest to this as well as Andrea, because she's a performer as well. Um, we know how to make everybody else happy. We just can't make ourselves happy. You know, I mean, I can get on stage all day long and you won't think that there's anything wrong with me. But as soon as I get back to my hotel room or I get back home, then everything starts coming down on you. So how do you deal? Right. Well, well th this, is, this is how this works. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you are a performer or if you're just a, a, a regular person. We, you, you can always be dealing with the dark moments. But I can only speak on my transition. So as a, as a combat veteran, dealing with the traumas of, of uh, wars and nightmares and all of those, and I'm also a artist, and I have been uh, using that form of expression uh, for more than 30-something years now. So, so it worked for me. It helped me deal with 
uh, you know, I've been married for 30 years now. So raising kids and trying to uh, uh, be married or, 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 or transition back into that family life, you know, it's, it's a balance. So I can only speak uh, from my experience and having those soldiers come from their, from their units and take a break from being mobilized and deployed. They were able to take a break from that environment and come into the performing and entertainment arena where they where I not only see them perform on stage, but we're on the road touring for eight to 10 months out of the year. So I was responsible for their whole entire wealth. So from their dental, health, medical, the whole nine. So I got to see them, like you are talking about, once they left the stage and everything is done, now it's time to go back to that room. Well, I was I was a counselor too, so they came and sat, and we had those discussions, we had those talks. Uh, so, what's important is to have peer support groups. So that's what we established uh, during that five year tenure. Um, on stage is something like you said, very different than when the lights go off, the show is over, and now you got to go back and deal with your with your real self in the mirror, and those deal with demons. those demons. So, yeah. so the important thing is, I say you deal with it by understanding that you do have problems and issues, but you're not the only one that's dealing with it. So, uh, so if that answers your question, I said peer support groups and finding other uh, people that were, are going through the same thing. So uh, that military environment was one of the unique things that I've been a part of because we all were dealing with some of the same elements of trauma, whether it's anxiety, depression, or post-traumatic stress disorder, we, we dealt with it all. And it was it was 24 seven. They didn't have their families around. They didn't have, you know, that that support. So we had to become that. Mm. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but but you're absolutely right. When we step off that stage, sure we can go out there and give one great show. But when that show is over, hey, all the people are gone. That thrill is gone. Mm. But but it's important to be able, like the gentleman we were talking about earlier, yeah. uh, and 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 the yeah, whole point of this one discussion. Of my issues with that as well. Uh, say again. Uh, the the whole point of the discussion is talking about how how black people deal with these these traumas. Uh, and he brought up a real important thing is. Uh, I think black people have to see examples of something different that is right and healthy for them. Uh, and, and, and when we grow up in these environments, uh, I grew up in Mississippi, and uh, when we understand that we all are part of a rape culture, we were taught a rape culture, so everybody's a victim. Uh, so when you understand that, uh, I think you can, you can break down those barriers and, and move forward. And you, once you understand that you're not the only victim here, everybody is. Even the person that was doing doing you wrong back in the day, uh, you know, they they didn't know any better either. So you have to see example and be the example. So and that's what therapy does for you. So just keep encouraging people to to uh, peer support group, go get help, talk to psychologists, psychiatrists. See, we didn't have that growing up. We just had, like, like uh, she was talking about, she, she said something about, uh, uh, we're going to keep it hush-hush. This is our business. Let's keep it in the family. Let's just walk around with the shame of having those sexual traumas and having those, you know, those ugly, nasty things to come out. But Generational look, curses. Yeah, but we came from a rape culture. We were taught that. So right. you have to understand that in order to not be so personal with it and put issues out on the table and say, this is something we're all going through, but this is what we need to do to move forward and, and, and put that uh, to the side. It's just like being a, what they call it, a, a functional depressant. That means you're depressed all the time, but you're able to go to work and take care of your basic needs, but you're still depressed. So we, we're, we're, we're functional, but we still need to uh, address our health a little bit better. Well, yeah. well, and I, 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 I agree with you. I think um, to answer your question further, and he's right, um, and, um, anything to distract your mind, anything will distract your mind for depression if you allow it to. But what people, what our people do, two things we don't do. 
we have disconnected ourselves from our seniors who has who has the knowledge and the understanding of long suffering like i said that's why i mentioned slavery for example there was no way those people could get out of slavery and produce same so, uh, uh, well, quote unquote same people if there wasn't something beneficial in their suffering uh, we our generation of people are disconnected from that we don't talk to the people who've been through 50 60 years of suffering and can like you say and can visualize to them and give them in real time how to suffer there's a way to suffer just like it is the way to party but the way we deal with it is we go off to a corner bury all our stuff i'm talking about black men and a lot of black women we go to church and this is no throw down on church we go to church on sunday morning to get the word from the preacher to satisfy our soul when that's our job we don't do the work so the the, the whole purpose of oral tradition was to teach young people how to do the work the work to balance their intellect and their spirit we, we we focus on the intellectual part that is what we learn to do and we don't pay very much attention outside of religion to the spiritual aspect of our being so when you go home and you're depressed and you're sitting there between your two ears dealing with depression and you do nothing depression is going to put its power on you but you have a power to do that you have to be taught that you have to be reintroduced to it i put it that way and most people the first thing i tell them to do the worst thing you can do when you get depressed is stay in the house why well your grandma would have told you you need to get some sun because if you don't get the vitamins out of the sun you're going to get depressed whether you have a problem or not so the first thing the press people do is go home pull the curtains give them a bottle of liquor or some good weed or whatever and bury that depression in that garbage bag i was talking about earlier <laughs> And, and, and we do this, we're doing the work, but we're working against ourselves. So we need to be reintroduced to those things that got our people through a horrendous, horrendous myopic experience and lose, use those things to benefit ourselves and we just don't know how to do it. So my suggestion is that we learn, I, I run a group, I do a group with a process. You know, and once I get it on video, I'll send it to you guys where I actually, I quit doing therapy and I started doing what I call educational therapy. Education, therapeutic education. Teach people how to manage their brain when they are by themselves. And, they, and people can be reintroduced to what's already in our DNA. We know how to suffer. We just turn it on ourselves and we call it depression. And then we get angry with it and then we call it anxiety. So, so I'm just saying there's some things we can do but if we follow Eurocentric models and, 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 and look outside of ourselves for solutions that happen in our head, it's not gonna happen. The artistic value of it is when you're painting, cause I was a fine arts major in undergrad, when you're painting or singing or, or playing the instrument, you feel good because you're connecting with your soul to do that. People don't, don't know that. That music is coming out of you, not that instrument. So naturally, when you put the instrument down and you think it's in the instrument, you walk in front the instrument, it's, it's in you. You should be able to take it home and do the same thing. If, if you understand what I'm trying to say in this short length of time. But the gentleman's right, artistic value, singing, anything where you got to dig deep down in yourself to create something non-visible into a visible and sometimes an opaque form, that's a spiritual encounter. And that comes in your DNA. I, I, I think you got to be very careful, though, when, when you're saying, when we say things, um, I know people like to bring slavery up a lot. Uh, and, and, and I think we have to be real careful because people are far removed from that particular struggle, but they will use that as a crutch uh, for, for their behavior or for their self-esteem, and they have no idea what forefathers or people went through and I think it becomes an easy crutch uh, for being lazy well we're, we're like this because of slavery so we don't we don't have to do any better so I, I, I agree I, so I, 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 agree. I, I agree with you uh, with that and, and I, I usually and I, I, I agree we shouldn't talk about slavery but we should talk about the experiences that the people had that got them through it because that's where the strength comes from the thinking process 
right. the spiritual encounter, the reaching out to your creator, the, the, the beating of the drums, the, 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 the will to work with each other and help each other, all those kind of things are the beneficial things that came out of that experience. May I ask a, a question, uh, please? Because I'm hearing a lot. Of People could mute their um, mute themselves because this is some really interesting information. And I really want to hear it, but I'm hearing like three or four different uh, a whole bunch of stuff going on in the background. I'm sorry to be there. Yeah, me too. I hear it too. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. Sounds like a radio or something. You you still here? Yeah, I think if we all except the person that's speaking, if everybody put yeah, that in here, I don't hear. Like I'm like I'm the technical person here. I am the least technical person. But no, but I, I'm hearing a lot of um. Uh, what do you call it when you hit a stop? Yeah, I mean, okay. no, no, no. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute mine so y'all. Yeah, the little squeaking. Yeah, a little squealing or whatever. Yeah. Just went away. Much better, guys and ladies. Much better. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Big, so, Big Mo, you got anything to add? Oh, well, you know, pretty much everything Big has been said. Yeah, pretty much everything has been said. So, I, I would still like to add... Um, I think somebody brought it up earlier because my father was uh, in the military and um, and my uncle Lester, you know, I remember they used to say all the, he was shell shot. You know, I, I didn't know what that mean. You know, they didn't want us to be around him at the time, you know. And we used to think we used to think it was funny to go up behind him and clap our hands or something. We thought that was the funniest thing, but as you get <laughs> then you realize, you know, because he was over in Vietnam and all Kind of stuff so he he was experiencing all that kind of stuff and i said well ever for the military i don't never want to be like still shot be, you know, be labeled as crazy or whatever but we see a lot of traumatic stuff you know you got to commit suicide you see you just see a lot of stuff you know people don't see on an everyday basis and we have to take and hope that stuff again. and like i say i'm, I'm fortunate enough to be with a peer-to-peer -peer group you know south combat group you know and um like I say, most of them are Vietnam veterans. It's like 90, 90% of them are Vietnam veterans, and they really brought us along, you know, on how to uh, handle this. The stuff that I was, you know, the stuff that I was going through, I'm thinking, man, I can't tell stuff, man. And then when I actually went to one of those groups and listened to some of them other guys, man, my problem seemed very minimal. I said, man, I'm going through something. But that guy right there, going through some stuff, man. But we got each other as a group. To sit there, military can identify. It doesn't matter, Army, Navy, Air Force. You can identify, you know, what because just a lot of things I can't even tell my wife, you know, because first of all, you know, the stuff like that she really don't need. To all that stuff on, but when you get with another person that's been through that, it, it makes it makes me put a whole lot. I'm, and I love going out helping other veterans, you know, when I can. However I can, you know. Barbara, Barbara for the long, but you know, she's a basket case. She's Barbara, get a function with the rest of us. It's not on you long enough to cuss him out. Okay. If I, so, can, uh, if I can just add a few words here because I've been hard. sitting here listening to you guys. And I didn't realize <laughs> I was going to be on. Can you guys hear me? Or this, this yeah, I hear you. Okay. Hear so you. I did not realize that I was going to be on here tonight with several veterans because, first of all, let me say this. We can hear you. I do not even know how to even express, especially to veterans, where or how or you got, or, or whatever way you guys dealt with feeling when you were going through it and the continuation of it. I listened, I have a, 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 a here's another thing. I'm pro veterans too. I do everything that's got anything to do with veterans out there. I'm, I'm for it. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I'm, I'm in, I don't know how people are gonna feel about this. And I, at this point, I really, I'm really not, 
really concerned, but my dad was a, was the proudest veteran I know. I don't know anybody who was, who was more proud to be a veteran than him. He fought in World War II. When he died, he lived to get his 21 gun salute. And when he died, they didn't give him his 21 gun salute. And um, they said that a captain overrode him at that period. And I'm, I'm saying all that to say, my mother knew how much my father lived to die. So I've been fighting that one of all the presidents that's been in, 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 in the office. The only one that has responded so far. And this is so, this is like I'm in tears about it because I thought Obama was going to step up. Donald Trump. Let me say this before anybody get anything uh, mixed up. Or <laughs> I I'm not, I, no, no. But by him stepping forward and wanting to make something happen by my father getting the 21 gun to I'm like, okay, so what do I do? So that brings that put on a little depression and anxiety to me. But when I listen to you guys, when I listen, and like you said, um, Mr. Dixon, you can't even talk about some of that stuff with your wife. Do you realize how 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 heavy that is? That's like how proud of you I am that you you want to protect her from knowing how much. You have suffered and are still suffering as a result of all the stuff that you did. Now, I do want to end this by saying this is going to make me even more pressed to get involved with this whole movement of, uh, of mental health awareness because black people, we, we just, in my neighborhood, it was, you say anything about going to a psychiatrist or a therapist and then you were automatically labeled crazy. Automatically. There was no there was no thinking that, oh, you know, we just didn't. It wasn't in our mindset where I grew up. We just, you, somebody said psychiatry, you're crazy. Period. So thank you for sharing that. And and, and uh, Mr. Baskin, I think that's why I wanted everybody to hear things so I could hear. This is so amazing. This is so amazing. So thank you for sharing yours. And also, the gentleman, I don't see him here on my um. The, the, he does the therapy and, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. I, this is amazing. Washington. Dr. Washington. Dr. Washington. Dr. Washington. Yes, thank you, Dr. Washington. I'm saying though, Michael, this this should have been a Zoom for the whole country or for the whole world, especially in this time. This time and this this period, the whole country, the whole world should be listening to this because this. To look at Mr. Dixon, you would think nothing's wrong with him. That he's mm. not going through any changes. You would not you must think look at him hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> what you say, Bob? You didn't look at him hard enough. <laughs> Take your glasses <laughs> off and look at him. <laughs> what I'm saying is, if you check out Mr. Baskin, you look at Mr. Dixon, you would think that they're just regular dudes, you know, just regular guys. <laughs> Mr. Baskin, maybe, but Mr. Dixon. <laughs> wow. His elevator do not go all the way to the top. It does not. So this is a, this is this is quite. This, this, and, and Michael, I think you should you should, you should consider making this like a hundred person room because there are a lot of people who could relate to this and also who could uh, who could add. I'm sorry, I don't mean to take up all this time. I'm gonna listen. <laughs> no, but um. Can I say this? Um, we all can, uh, even if we had a thousand people in here, everybody tell their story and whatever, we still don't get to the root of the problem. If we can't get to the root of the problem with the six or seven people we have right now, all is going to be a big cluster bomb or whatever, with everybody trying to get their point across and nobody still getting to the point of how do we deal? When I'm off, when I get off of this meeting, how do I go tell myself when I'm writing in my diary? Because that's how I have to deal with things. How do I say to myself, you know, I know some other people are going through this, but it still is not going to make me go to sleep until I'm still going to be up till three or four o'clock in the morning. Right. Go to sleep because you're thinking about everything. It's like everything is just coming in, just coming on you you got so much to worry about you, you got the 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 Ahmad Aubrey case you got um 
you got the fact that we don't know what this pandemic is going to do. You, you don't know, should I wear a mask? Should I not wear a mask? Am I, do I have, am I positive? Am I negative? You know, I didn't think this much about HIV. And I was out there. No, I'm just kidding. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, I mean, having a lot of people on is not going to help me. I don't know about anybody else. I, I think this is good enough for right now until we can get to the root of it and say, hey, this is what we got to offer everybody else. Because, well, um, can I answer your question? Because, um, like I said, I've been in this business for 50 years. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about actually practicing. Mm -hmm. There is no quick fix to this. There is no pill for it. And, and that's why I made the comment about the oral tradition where people taught folks how to long suffer. You're going to suffer as long as you allow yourself to suffer because you're in charge of your will. Now, you got to learn what I mean by that. And I don't mean you personal. I'm talking about yes. you, you plural. And you got to do the work. It's, it's a work to be done. But if you are stigma, if you are reacting to stigma, and you don't do what the gentleman said earlier, both of them said it. You got to get in the support group. You got to do the work. You got to go talk to people. If you sit and talk out loud, you can try this yourself. Get you a tape recorder, go home, take an hour a day and talk in that tape recorder. Just talk in it. Don't do anything for 30 days and go back and listen to it, I can guarantee you by the end of that 30 days, you ain't gonna be depressed. We got to do the work. You got to get it out of you, and you got to hear how it sounds when it comes back at you, so your mind will correct itself. It'll correct itself with a whole lot of instruction. That's what I meant. When you, one, of the, one of the things I was taught in undergrad is that a person got to go lay on the couch and tell you all that ain't long history for you to figure out who you are. And I took me 20 years to learn that's Eurocentric psychology. The knowledge for who you are are in you. You just have to go back up in there and find it. And the first thing you got to do is you have to that garbage can. You got to get that stuff out. And then your mind will correct itself. Because even, even post traumatic stress and those kind of things, you're going to always think about those things. But you can control and learn how to deal with it so you can live a peaceful life. That's possible. I got a process that I teach people. Like I said, I can't go in on the phone, but there's work to be done. But if you don't go to these, these meetings, if you don't seek out help, if you go home and you're scared and you're ducking, you're not working on the problem. So that's the, the solution is you got to do the work. And to add to that, I think there are just several ways, such as the arts. So there are, there's, there's art therapy, there's music therapy, there's poetry, there's, a diff, there's a, plenty of different ways to utilize as avenues to have what I was talking about right. before, the conversation. And, uh, right. You have to start slowly, because some people, it's a matter of just believing that they have a problem, phase one, and then learning that there are possible solutions that are healthier than what they are used to experiencing. Um, I know when I dealt with um, my clients quite often, the reason why I bought up the legacy is because they could be in a household where they're surrounded with people who they aren't at that phase yet. They don't see that there's a problem with how they're living, what things are going on. And so you need to trump up different supports so that when you hear one thing in your head and you're thinking this way, well, it can't be that bad. Maybe I am supposed to get hit. Well, maybe I am supposed to always eat healthy. Maybe a whole bunch of things. You need someone to counterbalance that and say, well, what about this? This is an alternative. I've had plenty of clients who told me I was the first person to express to them that there's another way. Like they just don't hear it at home. They haven't heard that before. Right. So you have to, you know, start by allowing them to believe that there is another paradigm that could work for them. And then I think Mr. Ernest was talking about the continuous wraparound. 
of, you know, <laughs> once you get off that stage, that person is still wrapped around by a community that can say, how are you feeling? So Barbara, to answer your question, I think for you, yes, writing in your, in your uh, diary is healthy. It's cathartic. It's getting it out. It is seeing it. Um, right. You also need to add on things like, you know, conversations with other people. I felt this and then I took it a step further. And this is how I began to get the momentum to feeling healthier. Um, does that mean that your diary now becomes a play? That, you know, how do you move forward to it's a space to where you feel like you're in a space where you're healthier than you were yesterday or this same time last year? He's right exactly, it's not a quick fix. It's not gonna happen overnight. I was a treatment worker, which meant that we work with families I've seen family for two, three years, and then some. Even when it's closed, I'm still talking to them. Um, that's all I want to say about that. <laughs> that's, that's good. Uh, you did it good. Mr. Well, Carter? Mr. Carter? Is he still there? Uh-oh, he's frozen. His picture is. Yes. Okay. Mr. Uh, may I ask Dr. Washington a question? While yes, ma'am. For, for uh, Mr. Potter. Um, when you say we've got to do the work, I was I had been distracted because I had a phone call and had to answer really quickly. When I came back, I was talking about mm -hmm. it. I was just hoping that you could elaborate a little more um, so I could understand what you um, about. <laughs> We got about six, seven more minutes uh, uh, before we end, and just to, just to caveat on on a lot of things that was said, I think the biggest thing is the the, the understanding. Of it. Huh? Can you hear me? You sound garbled. Got me now. I can hear you, but you sound garbled. Can't hear you clearly. It's it's it sounded like wah, wah, wah. <laughs> yeah. Chatting yeah. down, teacher. Wah, 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 wah. You want, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer your question. You yes, you sir. want to know what I mean by do the work? Um. Yeah. yeah I had I, I became distracted, so I didn't hear when you explained. I just wanted you to explain it again. Yes, sir. Well, I was saying yeah. that, and, 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 and um, um, I forget her name, the, 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 the social worker, her last comment, it's, too, it's not a quick fix. It's, it's not a quick fix, and to do the work, I don't think he can hear us either. I can hear you. All right. What about now? Oh, you can hear us? Okay. What okay. About yes, now? Okay. Um, if, if, for instance, every day you wake, do the work means can you hear me? You get, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. I was answering her question. She asked a question, what does that mean by do the work? Ah. Yeah, and and what I meant was um and and I forget her name. She she, she put a thing on it at the end of her conversation Andrea. about Andrina. She she mentioned that you 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 it's no quick fix. You have to work at it. You get ideas in your head all day long. So when those ideas come up, you got to find a, 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 a path, or as he said, a, 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 a process or a method of how you're going to distract those thoughts and how you're going to deal with them. And what most people do, most people who get depressed, they just bask in depression. But now you got to come up with a counterweight. You got to be able to talk to somebody or play some music or do something that is going to help you to deal with that. And as she said, find a better space for you to deal with it. And that calls for work. You got to think. You got to get in therapy. You got to pick up an instrument and learn to play it. Or you got to, as old folks say, go sit under a tree for an hour or two or go fishing. Or you got to find a space that it will allow you to work on the issues that are upsetting you or keeping you out of balance. And that calls for work. And the, and the last thing I'll say about that is 
what most people do, the old folks call it um, your right mind. Uh -huh. what, what most people do is ignore the voice that talks to them all the time. Schizophrenics, it talks to them out loud and then they get scared of it. But all of us have this voice. It's a inner voice. And it, it talks before our word talk, but we ignore it. So we're not familiar with it, what its role is. That's words. We got to figure out what is this thing we're talking to me. And you need help. You got to get someone to guide you sometime to get you started until you get off. It's just like anything else, but you got to do the work. Okay. Now, I want to ask this final question. I'm gonna, I, don't, I won't ask any more questions. Yes, I will. Um, is, is, it, is, it safe, is it safe to say that everybody, on some level or another, everybody, safe to say that we all have a level of, of a mental health to a degree? Is, is you, that mean, you mean a level of mental illness? You're getting a, a level of all of us are capable of, of going crazy, in other words. Is that what you ask? Yeah. Yeah, that's what well, yeah, I, we are. I don't know if you label it well, illness. Yeah, I guess it's continuous. So we all have a level of mental we're, we're all, Yeah, we're all everything. I mean, yeah, we, it's just a matter of getting some balance. And, and, and all crazy, all crazy isn't bad. Okay. Um, you know, yeah, we all can get. I call it. I don't use terms like mental illness. We just out of balance. Okay. We, we there's a balance between our soul, our spirit, and our intellectual life, our physical life. There's a balance. Okay. And we, when you find it, you have peace. And when you don't, we got all kinds of other things to call it. Crazy, intellectual, goofy, loopy, whatever. But Everybody is capable of, including me. I've been, I used to suffer from chronic depression until I did the work. I had to figure out what do I need to do to get out of this, who I need to help me. That's one reason why I switched my practice from Eurocentric to African Center Psychology. I found my space and then I went and did the work and learned what I needed to learn to do what I needed to do. Wow. And I would also like to add that it's perspective because I'm not entirely sure, but at some point, there was, uh, I was enlightened by the thought that the Native Americans have a totally diff different perspective regarding mental health and when exactly. someone who we might consider um, having an imbalanced moment, they look at that as their soul being released right. or attempting right. to transition to another higher level. And so it's not exactly looked upon as a negative as, you know, in the European models. Um, it's something that is more or less celebrated. Like this person is being honored with the ability to transition to another level. So it's perspective as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, like Barbara, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, you know, a position I could take in order to help get this. this that right there, that, right, those are the last three minutes that you guys gave me. Just monumental. I'm trying to figure how we could, just like she said, like the seven of us, eight of us, however many of us it is, how would we be able to take the message out? I mean, what, what's, where do we go? How do we do that? So there are a lot of resources that are available, especially now, because when we talked about depression, anxiety, isolation, so a lot of things have come up in terms of texting, video chats, and then just your community around you. And it's very important to remember to stay in contact, human contact. We know there's a lot of data out there that demonstrates the importance of human contact. And that could be even just a phone call, a conversation with someone who, who you haven't spoken to in a long time. I know that I'm here by myself. My only companion is my pet. And I'm happy to report that there are a lot of um, pounds that are empty now because a lot of people feel that need for human contact or contact with another being, another spirit. Um, and so it's, it's important to make sure that you have a phone call, an expression of joy every day. I do meditation daily. I communicate with people. I choose and I say, well, who can I speak to today that I haven't spoken to in a long time? Now is the time looking at the bright side of things. What can we do to maintain our, our mental health? So there are things that you can do, like I said, finding a group, a text group, because there are lots of them. If you just Google, there's crisis hotline, suicide prevention, it, it, it's 
it's exploding. It's exploding this mental health um, field right right now as a result, specifically as a result of this pandemic. Um, so you can just reach out. I think what she really was trying to say was, is there a way that Mr. Carter can take the take this panel okay. and have people pipe in and and ask specific questions or talk about their their the anxieties or the things they're going through. So that, Is there I've some kind of way that where we can make this public and people can, you know, call in or type in and say, Hey, I like what you're saying. This is what's happening to me. There are groups have the that two- have popped up that are like, um, how are you doing really? That was a group mm-hmm. that I recently discovered. So, you know, everyone asked the question, how are you? And most people just say fine. And so this group took it a step f- further and said, how are you doing really? And they want, they would, they would like for people to check in on another level with people. So that's something that could happen where you have a Monday night check-in. How was your weekend? You know, that's a question that you used to get every time you walk back into the office. What did you do over the weekend? Maybe it can be a, a, a reboot of that question. How was your weekend? How are you doing? How did you, how did you find the weekend? And, it, and, and, and this is, uh, this is not the, uh, this will be aired uh, actually May 24th. Uh, 25th, excuse me, May 25th. So everybody uh, will get uh, information about that. Also, uh, you know, a, a lot of times as we get ready to kind of dime this down, um, a lot of times what it is, I think a lot of uh, the biggest thing is understanding that we have a problem. And that's one of the right. things I had to figure out. I had to understand that I did have a mental health problem. And I believe that's a lot of issues with a lot of other people because we don't know we have a problem. Until right. either someone tells us or we do something crazy and people say, hey, man, something wrong with you. Your brain ain't right. You know what I'm saying? So I suffer right. from PTSD, TBI, all that crazy depression, anxiety. <laughs> then I have to figure out a coping mechanism in order for me to deal with this situation. Because when I'm out, like like how Miss Carlisle said, when she's out doing comedy, you know what I'm saying, it's easy for her to connect with the crowd because... You know, it's people in the seats. And then now you're on stage and you're talking to people and you're expressing yourself and you're doing this and that. But as soon as you go home and have to deal with the loneliness of the people gone, everybody gone, you feel like you ain't got nobody to talk to. So now what do I do? Do I go to sleep, which I can't do that? Do I pop these pills, which are making it worse? You know, uh, do I kill myself? Or, you know, there's a, a plenty of plenty of things that we think about when we're by ourselves. You know what I'm saying? So I had to figure out a lot of coping mechanisms. And one big thing I do is I isolate myself from people. I like to travel. I have to travel. And me and uh, Ernest, I, I go see him a lot because he's my battle buddy. And a lot of times you can't communicate with people that don't understand what you're going through. It's hard for us to do that because it's like you're talking to a brick wall because sometimes you won't feedback. And then the feedback they give you feel like it's sympathy, like they got sympathy for what you've been through. And so you sit there and you're like, okay, why am I talking to this person? They don't understand me. They don't know what the hell I'm going through. So if I can communicate with someone that has been through what I've been through and they understand, that makes it easier for me. And that's just that, I mean, that's just how I cope with it because it makes it easier for me to be able to communicate with somebody that I know has been through the same struggles that I've been through. So it makes it better. And we can sit around and we can talk all day and all night till probably three, four, five o'clock in the morning. And then Ernest will wake me up at like seven o'clock and I'm still tired. But we wake up and we start it over again because we feed off each other's energy. And the energy makes it even better because that communication is great. But when the communication is gone, what do we do next? You know what I'm saying? And then I, I, I know with a lot of men, it's an ego thing, you know what I'm saying, outside of the civilian world because we ain't gonna too much get up there and sit around and, and, and tell people that there's something wrong with us. You know what I'm saying? We're not gonna do it. Plus, we don't understand what the hell is going on. So if we don't understand it, we'll never know. So uh, I had to figure that out. So I have coping mechanism that I do that helps me with my PTSD, that helps me with my depression. I popped pills when I was in the military because they gave me all these pills to cope with it. 
but the pills made it worse. My depression got worse. My nightmares got worse. I was waking up feeling froggy. I was having bad dreams, even with the nightmare pills, I was having dreams. And then I wake up and I call people like three, four o'clock in the morning, not, not even knowing that I called them. And then the next day they tell me, hey man, you know what you're saying? Like they, they like blowing my phone up because I think I was talking some suicidal mess. Right. So the pills didn't even make it better. So I had to break right. away from those pills and figure it out on my own. So I, I think a lot of it is the individual have to figure out himself how to cope with what he's dealing with and then bring other people in to kind of help him. You know what I'm saying? Or to help the other person. So you're doing you know I mean? some form of self-motivational interviewing. It's a technique that's used where you do motivational interviewing and you're asking questions about when you're in an experience, what things were positive about this experience. And you try to capture those moments, like how you said you felt that Mr. Ernest understood. That's something that you put in your toolbox as a coach. So I'm going to talk to someone that I know that understands. Then the next thing, well, I understand that when we were talking, he listened. And so you put that in your toolbox. I need someone that understands, and I need someone that's going to listen. And so you start building your toolbox little by little to figure out you're on the right track. You're learning how to cope. And sooner or later, you know, like if I'm feeling triggered by whatever it is that are your triggers, what do I have in my toolbox at this time that I could pull out and start to bring my anxiety, depression level, my isolation that I'm feeling like I want to crawl into? How can I reduce those things with the items that I have in my toolbox? But it, again, it involves work. Indeed. Right. Indeed. Got to do the work. That was good. I like that. <laughs> I'm going to get that. I told her that. I, she, she, that was awesome. See, <laughs> it came out of me and went women. into her. You know, that was really my words. Let me ask this. Yeah, let me ask this. And this is for the uh, the counselors on the panel. What if you have like family members that keep pushing the button for you? You know, like say you, there was a time when you might have had some things where you had to go to get some kind of counseling or whatever, and just to get on your nerves, they bring it up all the time. Like, uh, say, can I react to that? They know that you went and saw a psychiatrist or something, and so when they just want to get on your nerve, they'll say, "Well, don't talk to her. You know she's crazy." So how do you how do you deal with that when you know? I, yes, I'm a comic, but a lot of stuff ain't funny. Like the fact that I did have to go to a psychiatrist. Well, or, you know. let me try to respond to that. Um, I'm not a religious person, but I'm going to use, use a religious example to get the point across that I'm trying to get on them, based on what you just said. The only power people have over you is what you decide to give them. And I, the, the Bible um, 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 representation I'm going to use, the part where it says God gave man the will and even God can't control that. So what I'm getting at is, the only way somebody can, in, re in real in reality, get on your nerves is for you to give them that power to allow them to do that. Now, you got to learn, there's, a le there's some work to be done to understand the ramifications of what I just said. But just like um, Mr. Carter said, once you understand that, then you don't have to get upset about anything anybody does. Because you don't want to have control over that. So people yeah, who allow that to, to happen. to that point. Well, you got to do the work. That's what I'm saying. You got to learn. I, I just use that as an example, but you got to work. To, once you recognize that and learn it and rewire your brain to understand it, then you will adjust. You will adjust to it. But the trick is learning that. Because they, they don't have to get on your nerves. You gave your power away. When you allow somebody, you get upset because of what somebody else did. That's because you have given your power to them. You ascribe them the power in you to turn your nerves on yourself. Well, how do you deal with, what, what do you call it then when it's the embarrassment of people knowing? And, and that's why, it, that's exactly why when we come back to the root well, problem that people don't want to go and, and see about their problem because there are going to be people who are going to pick it up. 
there are going to be people who always bring it up. Uh, but, yeah, but, but, you're, but, but it's but, not a matter yeah. of giving away your power. It's a matter but, of, you know. But, but, you, but you said something earlier. You're, you're not you're not mad at that that person. He's talking about you giving your power away, but you you have to identify what the problem is. You you you're feeling emotional because of the way you see yourself in relations to what they're doing right. or saying. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but but if you get a handle on what the problem is, it does not matter because you right. have conquered you have conquered the problem. So it comes so, back to so the it, same circle though. The embarrassment. That's right. Can, okay. Let, but but, but you're crazy. why you embarrassed? No, I'm you're embarrassed to go from the beginning. That's why a lot of people don't go. But it's a so you're right. for that. It's a reason for that. That embarrassment yeah, yeah. just like we were talking about people don't talk about molestation and all those things. It's a reason why you were taught that. And you mm -hmm. done picked up like she, you put a lot of bad uh a bad bad tools in your coping box. So, mm -hmm. so in order to get outside that, and everybody's not qualified to give you guidance. That's right. that's one thing, but right. but but you need to start understanding that it's not those people. It's how it's how you see yourself in relations to what right. they're doing. Right. So it comes back to you. It comes back to you accepting and owning whatever your issue is. Like Carter was just saying, he had to say, "I have this this problem." It's like when they say, "Don't just say this problem." What problem? What is it? Like once you figure out what makes you feel embarrassed, anytime somebody say it, you, you just have to conquer those things. And then you gotta do and you gotta do the and you got to do the work. Like he's saying, like like in the in the in, in all of the, the the psychiatrists and psychologists and all the classes that I've that I've gone through, it comes down to the person uh doing the work and mm. and, and and it's not it's, it's not going to come by anybody else doing it for you. Now, you so know, talk all day, we internalize a lot of things. things. Is Dr. Washington speaking? No, that, he was speaking. Go ahead. Okay. So we internalize a lot of things and we start to believe it. So the mm -hmm. shame, the guilt, the embarrassment, all those things are what we start to carry around. We're carrying that around from the people who gave it to us. We take it. We accept it. But we could also take it and change it with our perspective. Yes, I may feel a certain way. However, I know that I'm doing the work. So you can finish that sentence. I may have gone to therapy. However, it's leading me to a healthier life. Yeah. You can change the narrative in wow. your head. And that would also start to change the perspective of things, how, the lens in which you look through. you look through. Yeah, it's like challenging somebody on their belief system. People have belief systems that's not grounded in anything except for what somebody said. So they don't have any grounds for what they believe. So once you challenge them, they start feeling some kind of way. But why do you believe that? Right. Wow, so y'all on a mission. Y'all working tonight. Yes, y'all are working tonight. And, and I would say this, and I would say this too. If it helps you, because you're the one got to deal with it. I give a damn what anybody say. I got to help me. I got to fix me because I get sick and tired of feeling this way. You know what I'm saying? So damn what they say. They can call me crazy out there. Have my family and friends know I'm crazy any damn way. So what they say to me don't bother me. They can block that because I can't let nobody steal my joy. I have to fix this situation because one, I can't let it ruin my life. I can't let it ruin my relationships. I can't let it ruin my sleep. I can't let it ruin me being depressed. I can't let it ruin me being having anxiety. And that, give them that finger and tell them they can do something with it and then keep it pushing because I got to fix it. So this way it starts right here. I'm the one going through it. I'll say this. I'll say this again, because this is the hardest lesson, and I like what you said, Mr. Collins. Because once you understand something, it's a game. It's a game changer. And one of the things that black people have a problem understanding, and we learn this from the Europeans, is somebody made me feel something, and that's not real. That does not happen. But if you believe it, you will think it's real. But it's not real. And once you understand that anything outside of you that somebody brings to you 
has nothing to do with you except for how you feel about it. And that's a choice. That's your will. But that's the <laughs> hardest thing to get people to accept the responsibility and the ownership of their own will to make their own choices about things that's happened in their lives. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. What you think about me is none of my business. There you go. <laughs> I wonder, you know. I what somebody else has to say about you ain't none of your business. <laughs> right. right. That's, the, right. that's right. so deep. That's just so right. deep. Oh my God. Y'all are <laughs> dang. Oh my God. This, that's yeah. So, so, so do anybody have any last minute words before we uh, drop off and, and bid everybody a do? Well, I think that what somebody has to say about you is your business if they write it on the bathroom wall. So you got to look at it that way. Hey, Barbara, what'd you say? Say it again. If they write it on the bathroom wall, then it becomes your business. And Big Mo is good at that. He writes in crayon. Hey, I just want to add thing. Hey, hey, Barbara, did I leave my toothbrush over there last night? <laughs> this is when it's going left. This is when it's going left. <laughs> and cut. <laughs> Bye -bye. Are we going to do this anytime soon again, um, Michael? Yes, uh, I'll, uh, Tori's going to put it all together. Uh, and then she'll she'll put it out to everybody yeah, that y'all yeah. uh, put another one. We'll probably pull some more people on uh, to kind of elaborate a little bit more on what we talked about tonight. Uh, but yeah, this is great. This is lovely. You know, I got my mental uh, stimulation right here tonight. Yeah, this, this was <laughs> tonight. Thank you for inviting me. This was really this this was where's Power Nine Hundred Four? Did you write you? Jacksonville. Sorry. Hey, yeah. Come on, baby. You're the bomb. Hey. And, and Sylvia. All of y'all. Sylvia, before we go, time. can you give us what the Whoopi Goldberg have to say about this kind of meeting? Oh, yeah. Give them oh, the Whoopi if, Goldberg. If, oh, okay. If Whoopi Goldberg, is, is Dr. Washington still on here? Is Dr. Washington still on here? It's still Washington. I'm, I'm, I don't have PhD, but yeah, I'm on. Okay. If. If Whoopi Goldberg was here, she would probably say, where did Mr. Carter go? Where did Mr. Carter go? He got to be on here because I got, okay, there he is. Okay. Uh, I'm right here. Whoopi would say, Whoopi would say, um, well, 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 well let, let, let me, let me just say this. <laughs> let me, let me say this. I'm just as crazy as they come. As a matter of fact, <laughs> when I'm on the view in the morning, I, I say some things and I wish I hadn't said them. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. And I, yeah. I, resort, I, I resort to my good friend yeah. who's also a talk show host. I go to Wendy Williams. Wendy, come here. Come here for a second. <laughs> 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 oh my God! How you doing? How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, get this. You guys know that Kevin oh, and, so so like and had it not been for Dr. Washington and some oh, of man, and, and like some it. of what he told me, I don't know where I'd be. And Andrea, I'm gonna call you. Okay, okay. guys. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs>